Welcome to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, a weekly look at the latest news in Louisiana agriculture. Coming up, we'll have a look at this week's Louisiana Ag News headlines. We'll look inside the markets with commentary from experts at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. We'll check out the latest happenings at the state capitol and in Washington, D.C. in our grassroots government segment. And we'll hear from one of you as we take you to the fields and pastures of the Bayou State and find out the latest in crop and cattle conditions. All of this and more coming up on this week's podcast. Now, here's the host of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, Kerry Martin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 21 of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast for Friday, November 8th. I'm your host, Kerry Martin. Our podcast this week is originating from Kansas City, Missouri, where I'm attending the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention along with my cohort, Don Molino. He and I have been doing a lot of interviews this week with newsmakers from around the country, and we'll bring you a lot of those stories on today's podcast. We'll also get some help from back home, Avery Davidson, who is host of the weekly television show This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, is helping us out this week. He'll handle the In the Field segment as well as grassroots government this week. We'll kick it off as usual with news headlines, and as I mentioned, a lot of those stories will come from right here in Kansas City at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention, as well as stories from back home there in Louisiana. We'll follow that up with Grassroots Government, where Avery talks to Kyle McCann. Kyle is the National Affairs Coordinator for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, and he'll talk about the results of the midterm elections and their effect on agriculture, especially the Farm Bill, which is still stuck in conference committee. In the In the Field segment this week, Avery talks with Jacob and Carrie Rumbaugh of Caddo Parish. They'll give us an update on what's been happening on their farm up in the northwest corner of the state, as well as talking about a special award that they won this past summer and a trip they'll be taking to New Orleans to compete in the National Outstanding Young Farmer and Rancher Achievement Award contest. We'll have our market analysts check in with us, Grayson Close and Mark Tall with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. will give us an update on the grain and rice markets, and Grayson will talk about the USDA's crop production and supply and demand report that was released on Thursday of this week. Dave Foster will check in with his update on the cattle markets, and we'll wrap it all up with a look at the ag calendar. All of that coming up on Episode 21 of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. And it all kicks off right now. Here's a look at the latest news headlines in Louisiana agriculture on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Now that the midterm elections are over, Democrats will control the House and Republicans will control the Senate and the White House. Here in Kansas City, we spoke with Don Parrish. He's a senior director of congressional relations for the American Farm Bureau Federation, and he says they're ready to deal with divided government. We've got a House that are going to be controlled very, with very tight margins by the Democrats, and you've got a Senate that's controlled by the Republicans. Obviously, Mr. Trump still remains president. You know, it's going to be an interesting time. I think if we get anything done, you know, they're going to have to figure out how to work together. If they don't, then we have gridlock. That's, you know, hopefully we move beyond gridlock and figure out how to work with one another. But, um, you know, we'll wait and see how that comes out. We'll have more on the results of the midterm elections from a Louisiana perspective coming up in our grassroots government segment when Avery Davidson talks with Kyle McCann of the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. During our conversation with Don Parrish of the American Farm Bureau Federation, we asked him about water issues, specifically WOTUS, the controversial Waters of the U.S. rule that's currently held up in the courts. Parrish says that Farm Bureau has been fighting water issues for American farmers for years and will continue to do so as long as it's necessary. We want farmers to be able to recognize when they drive out across their farm what's regulated and what's not in terms of, of the Clean Water Act. 
I think that's important, but the flip side of that is farmers are for clean water too. Uh, it's on our farms, it's on our land. We want a clean, healthy environment. So, you know, right now we've got kind of three things going on in the, in the area of the Clean Water Act. We have some litigation over a rule that the Obama administration finalized back in 2015. We believe that rule is illegal and we're hopeful the courts are going to come back with decisions to find it illegal right after the first of this year. Uh, we're also working with this administration to try to replace that rule. And we're hopeful by, before the end of this year they propose a regulation that provides the clarity that farmers need. That clarity will allow farmers to provide clean water. We hope those clear rules allow us to comply with the Clean Water Act. You know, I think there's a, just a perception out there that, that the federal government kind of needs to, to regulate every drop of rain. And I mean, when you have raindrops that hit the surface well, so of, the, of the earth, it may wind up in the ocean. And I mean, you being from Louisiana, you know how the Mississippi River flows from, you know, 31 states in this country right down to the, Mississippi, right down to the Gulf of Mexico. What happens to that water all along the way is important. I think this rule is going to do a good job, good job making sure that we know which of those waters are regulated at the federal level and which of them are regulated at the state level. And we all, we want them all protected. Sugar policy was another issue discussed here in Kansas City at the National Farm Broadcasting Convention. Don Molino has more. Luther Marquardt with the American Sugar Alliance points out 2018 was a tough year for his industry. We had a farm bill that we had to work through and uh, we worked very closely with the Louisiana cane growers. We bring growers up uh, and growers from all the beet areas come in and they work as teams to go and they make over 300 visits to uh, House and Senate offices talking about the importance of sugar policy. And this year in the farm bill in the House uh, there was an attack on our policy we won by 141 votes, and that strong showing uh, showed the Senate that they didn't need, even need to vote on a sugar uh, uh, attack on sugar policy. So we feel very good about that. We need to get that bill done now, and we think that will get done this year. There's no reason for the Republicans to push it to next year, and the Democrats want it done too. So we'll uh, we think we get it done. And now we've got a divided Congress and White House. How's that going to affect things going forward, do you think? Well, look, I think on the trade issues, we came through the uh, Mexico-Canada negotiations quite well. That's going to have to be dealt with next year. Uh, but I think that they will get that passed. But they're looking at other trade agreements with Japan and, and uh, the Philippines and uh, some in Europe and UK. So we've got a lot on the trade front that we're going to have to look at. We're the third largest importer of sugar in the world. And so we look at trade agreements from a defensive standpoint versus most of agriculture. It's an offensive strategy where you're looking for foreign markets to get into. But thus far, uh, Trump administration understands the importance of a strong domestic sugar industry and the need to make sure that we push back and respond to the unfair foreign trade practices that other countries like India and Thailand and Brazil do to drive world market prices below cost of production. And sugar doesn't cost the government anything, does it? No. For the last 16 years, we've had no cost to the American taxpayer. Only one year was there a cost and that's when Mexico subsidized and dumped sugar into this market, collapsing the market. But for the next 10 years going forward, with Mexico fixed, uh, it won't cost the taxpayers any money. And from a consumer pr perspective, consumers are getting sugar in this country at 22% less than the average of what they would pay in other developed countries. So the consumer's getting a good deal, the taxpayer's getting a good deal, and the sugarcane farmers and sugar beet farmers have a safety net that they can operate in. At the 75th Annual National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention, I'm Don Molino in Kansas City. Cotton and soybean harvest is now wrapping up in Louisiana. The latest Louisiana Crop Progress and Condition Report shows that cotton harvest is now 86% done, with soybean harvest sitting at 93% done. Sweet potato harvest is also on the downhill side, with 72% of the sweet potatoes now out of the ground. 
Sugarcane farmers are making very good progress in harvesting their crop. We're sitting at 31% completed. That's right on track with the 29% five-year average. Sugarcane condition ratings are 14% excellent, 50% good, 32% fair, 4% poor to very poor. A new sweet potato variety is being tested in northeast Louisiana as farmers bring in the 2018 crop. LSU Ag Center sweet potato researcher Dr. Don Labonte says this variety doesn't have a name yet, so he's calling it 1381. Do they have that extra flavor kick to them? You know, do they have that extra sheen and shine to the skin? And that's like where this 1381 comes in. It's got that curb appeal. It looks so nice. But there's a lot more to finding a new variety than just looks. So we've been looking at it for a number of years. It's always like, okay, have we looked at it enough? Have we seen seen it in enough places and we've seen it where it's been in drought in too much rain too much you know all the different environments you can throw at it and then we have a feel for what it can and cannot do. Louisiana rice is headed to the Florida panhandle to assist victims of Hurricane Michael. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation and the USA Rice Federation both got word that a volunteer group was headed to that region and they were looking for donations of rice. Farmers Rice Mill in Lake Charles stepped up and arranged for a pallet to be donated. Kennedy Rice Mill in Marouge did the same. The LSU School of Veterinary Medicine is receiving the largest donation in the history of the vet school. Herman and Connie Sung have pledged $10 million from their estate. The money will be used to care for injured and homeless animals, pay for scholarships, support oncology research, and fund forensic training to help veterinarians and law enforcement identify animal abuse. Most Louisiana cattlemen are busy putting hay in their barns for the winter. However, Matt Travis of Kentwood is taking hay out of the barn and shipping it to Georgia. That's because he's helping cattlemen who have been devastated by Hurricane Michael. Several weeks ago, Travis took a trip to Georgia to see the devastation firsthand. We've seen farms that their fences was tore up, trees down, houses gone. Most tractors didn't even have a window left in them. Come home and there were several more farmers asked, said, you know, what could we do? And we come up with the idea of the hay. I talked to one guy in Georgia, which is where this hay's going. He don't have, his fences is gone. And all they have now is they're having to keep them basically pinned up. Some 2,000 cattle pinned up and they're having to feed them feed, hay. Of course, it goes fast whenever you have to do that. No grazing. Several of Travis's neighbors have donated hay as well as free trucking. USDA released its latest crop production and supply and demand report on Thursday. And here's a look at how some of the Louisiana numbers came out. Overall, USDA left most of the production numbers unchanged in Louisiana. Corn for grain production is forecast at 76.5 million bushels. That's unchanged from their October forecast. Cotton production, 420,000 bales. Again, unchanged from their October numbers. Rice production, 30.4 million hundredweight, unchanged again from October. Sorghum production, 665,000 bushels, that's the same as they estimated last month. Soybean production, forecast at 65.5 million bushels, unchanged from October. That number, of course, is a little interesting with all the soybeans that we know were destroyed out in the field because of flooding conditions. So we'll just have to wait until their next report to see if there's some revision to that. About the only change that USDA really made in their forecast is in sugarcane production. Louisiana sugarcane production forecast at 15.4 million net tons. That is up 4% from the October forecast and up 5% from a year ago go. Apples are a crop that's affected by tariffs and trade issues perhaps more than most other commodities. Don Molino learned more about that here in Kansas City. Jim Bayer is president of the U.S. Apple Association. We hear people say that NAFTA was the worst trade deal in history, but for most of agriculture and certainly for apples in particular, it was the best 
trade deal in history. With NAFTA, we quadrupled our exports to Mexico. We doubled our exports to Canada. So we're glad that the that the uh, Trump administration has negotiated a new trade agreement with Mexico and Canada. We're glad that that's done. But they need to take the next step and remove the steel and aluminum tariffs on Mexico and Canada. Because until that happens, it won't matter. The, the, the new trade agreement will be pointless if we are still getting retaliated against. And here in the Apple industry, we've got a big target on our back. We often find ourselves the target of retaliatory trade actions because our commodity is, is perishable. So we can't store it forever. So unlike your listeners in, the, in beautiful Louisiana, let's say uh, rice, you know, you, you don't want to store it for a year or more, but you could if you had to. Uh, with apples, you cannot do that under any condition. So we make a really convenient target, and we'd like to see that all get settled so we can get, just get back to doing what U.S. agriculture does so well, and and uh, that's providing a great product and shipping it around the world, whether it's soybeans or rice or cotton or, or apples. It's all important in the export trade. And you just told me something I didn't realize that we export a whole lot of apples every year. Yeah, we do. And uh, we export about a billion dollars worth of apples, as a matter of fact. Our number one market is Mexico. Historically, our number two market was Canada, but India just passed them earlier this year, and they were accelerating like crazy in their purchases until the trade war started. So Mexico, India, Canada, and China, which is a new market for us, and when the president talks about competing with China and winning, the U.S. apple industry was competing and winning. We have full two-way access to both markets in both directions. And from May of 2015, when we got that market opened until May of 2018, China grew from a market of zero to a market of uh, our number five largest export market. And and, uh, importantly, they're buying the top quality varieties that you and I would see in the supermarket, and they're paying premium prices to get it. So that was a really bright spot on the horizon, a growing market, a high value, high quality market, and that's all at risk now because our tariffs into China are now 50%. And that market generally is uh, happens all with the Chinese New Year in January. So people would like to be making those sales now for shipment in December, time to be there for the Chinese New Year. If we miss that market, we'll have missed it for a whole year. So we're really anxious to see this trade dispute get settled. We're kind of not sleeping so well at night these days. We know that agriculture is, you know, the bounty of American agriculture. Uh, I don't. I think it's underappreciated how important it is to our U.S. balance of trade, uh, no matter what the commodity is. And apples are just happy to be a part of that. And and uh, we like telling our story. So thanks for listening. Thanks for your interest. At the 75th annual National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention, I'm Don Molino in Kansas City. And I want to wrap up the news segment this week by congratulating my broadcast partner, my longtime friend, and my mentor. Don Molino. You just heard Don's report there on apples. You hear his reports on every episode here of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. And for the past 30 years, you've been hearing Don on the radio in Louisiana reporting agriculture news and market information to try to give you the information that you need to be a better producer of food and fiber. Don was awarded the National Association of Farm Broadcasting's Farm Broadcaster of the Year on Friday of this week. It is the highest award given in the farm broadcasting industry. In my opinion, Don was very deserving of it, and I want to congratulate him and let all of you know that in Louisiana, we have the best farm broadcaster in the country in Don Molino. So if you see Don Molino or talk to him on the phone or send him an email, be sure to congratulate him for being awarded the 2018 National Farm Broadcaster of the Year. Coming up next, it's time for Grassroots Government. We're going to throw it back to Louisiana, where Avery Davidson visits with Kyle McCann of the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. They'll talk about the midterm elections and what effect that is going to have on the Farm Bill and other ag issues. That's coming up next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast.
This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. If you're a farmer or rancher, Farm Bureau wants you to join and be a part of their family. I grew up in Louisiana farm country, and I know all the hard work and sacrifice that you put into raising livestock, growing a crop, raising a family, and running a farm. Farm Bureau puts that same hard work and sacrifice into making life better for you and your family, so join today. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. It's time for a look inside the halls of government in this week's edition of Grassroots Government on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. On Grassroots Government this week, we talk about the midterm elections and what effect they will have on the farm bill and other agricultural issues coming up. Here's the host of the weekly television show This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, Avery Davidson. Thanks, Carrie. Joining me for the Grassroots Government segment of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast is Kyle McCann, the Louisiana Farm Bureau National Affairs Director. And Kyle, we are going to see a change of leadership in Congress and the House this coming year. How is that going to affect the Farm Bill during the lame duck session and moving forward? Well, we're hoping it'll expedite matters in trying to reach an agreement uh, for conferees to uh, come forth with a bill that can be passed during the lame duck before we adjourn this Congress and the next takes over. And you mentioned about trying to get this done in the lame duck session. What is that going to mean uh, compromise wise for the House or between the House and Senate versions since it is already in conference committee? Well, the number one stumbling block has been the work requirement on the food and nutrition programs. Uh, If you can't reach a compromise on that now, uh, then it goes to the next Congress, which will be controlled by the Democrats, and they will see that leave. So you now have a more of an, uh, I guess you could say, an opportunity to work together on the things that you do agree on, the things that you don't, particularly this item, Uh, is something that will have to be compromised on or else you don't have as much say-so in the final outcome of this bill as you would next year. How important is it that we get something done as soon as possible, especially given low commodity prices, markets that are less than favorable, and disaster for our soybean farmers here in Louisiana? Right. It's extremely critical we get something done. Not only do our farmers need to know what kind of foundation of a program they'll have underneath them as they move forward, but so do the lending institutions, which will play a dramatic role in what gets planted and who's farming what next year. Secondly, it's very important in the political process because you'll start a new year with a new budget cycle. We're running a larger deficit. There'll be more of a push to cut and who are you going to cut? And we would be up for reauthorization during that process. You would probably see additional attacks on payment limits, uh, crop insurance uh, things, as well as just payments overall, and you would face a a much harsher environment again uh, next year. So it's best to get it done now uh, before we have to do new scoring through OMB about what kind of budget cuts will be necessary. Any things, any surprises that we saw when it comes to the election here in Louisiana? No surprises as far as Louisiana is concerned. Our congressional delegation was reelected in in total. Um, A lot of the uh, races uh, weren't even close in our state. We've got some members that uh, are very good at doing their job and their districts are pretty well defined. And so no one was upset at all in the outcome of this race. Obviously, we only have one Democrat from Louisiana representing us in the House. All the rest are Republicans. How is that going to affect the leadership uh, that Louisiana has, especially concerning Steve Scalise? Well, uh, obviously, they'll be in the minority party. Um, Steve Scalise will still have a major leadership role as it goes forward, but we won't be in control of the agenda in terms of what is going on in Congress or the Republicans will not be. Uh, Most of our members will um, have to deal with that in their role in the committees and what those committees will actually work on. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Kyle McCann. He is the National Affairs Director for the Louisiana Farm Bureau. Next up, it's time to go in the field to talk with one of you about what's going on on your farm. Avery Davidson speaks with Jacob Rumbaugh of Caddo Parish, coming up next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast.
What comes out of the ground creates energy and has been a major contributor to Louisiana's economy for over two centuries? No, it's not oil. It's sugar. Sugar cane, sweet sugar cane. Ever since the Jesuits began cultivating sugar in colonial Louisiana, this sweet crop has had a major impact on our economic well-being. Each year, our sugarcane industry creates an economic boon of nearly $3 billion for the Bayou State. This vital business engine supports fuel and fertilizer distributors, tractor and automotive dealerships, supermarkets, and more than 15,000 Louisiana jobs. The sugar industry also benefits research universities and schools, banks, and insurance agencies. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane. The Louisiana sugarcane industry, helping empower the people of Louisiana for more than 220 years. Louisiana Sugar, making life sweeter, naturally. We're taking you to the fields of Louisiana as we hear from one of you in the field on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. We go in the field this week all the way up to Caddo Parish, way up in the northwest corner of Louisiana. Avery Davidson once again steps in to help us out as he speaks with Jacob Rumball. Thanks, Carrie. We're going to head out into the field. On the phone with me is Jacob Rumbaugh. And Jacob, uh, you and Carrie uh, won a pretty prestigious award last uh, June over there in New Orleans for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation Convention. That is correct. A very prestigious award. Yeah, the Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award is uh, is one of those that is probably the pinnacle of any of the YFNR awards. Tell me a little bit about what that was like. Uh, well, uh, you know, we really didn't get in terribly involved in agriculture, uh, at least full time until later, um, you know, really until I was 30 years old. So we were we were pretty late coming into Young Farmers and Ranchers. Um, but got involved pretty fast and really didn't know anything about the Achievement Award. Um, and Carrie Martin actually suckered me in on that, had me fill out an application, I think one of my first years to farm. But, you know, so we slowly grew into it, um, got involved, and uh, it was a really neat experience because it is it is an incentive to be involved and to learn more about your industry and very thankful for the process. Oh, I know Carrie Martin hosts this podcast, but a lot of people don't realize he's also a very good writer when it comes to uh, filling out those applications and making nominations. Uh, he's he's had more than one person he's helped uh, win that achievement award. What was that application process like? A beating. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beating, but it's you know it it, it helps you evaluate. Um, you know, you do some research and and you one of the things they want you to show in this application is how far you've come. You know, they, they'll ask you what your first year was like, how you've evolved, how you've grown. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a pretty cool process to, to see how far we have come, you know, since our first year in ag. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, we enjoyed it. it. It's, it, it's a long process though. It's a long application. Well, you won the truck from Louisiana. Now you're going on to, uh, the American Farm Bureau Centennial Convention in New Orleans to compete there. Um, might get another truck. Well, we hope so. Well, what advice would you have for someone who is considering entering the uh, the Achievement Award process? Well, the first thing is you, you do need to be involved. I mean, a lot of it is going to be, you know, Farm Bureau involvement, involvement in your community. And, you know, it, it, it a lot of it will reward your involvement in Farm Bureau and your community. So I say, you know, you really need to get your ducks in a row, uh, become involved specifically in Farm Bureau and keep good records of everything you've done. Well, talking about records, you guys have been uh, having some, uh, had a record drought, if you will, earlier this year because y'all, it was the first time in about, what, eight years that y'all had a D3 drought in your part of the state. Uh, now you guys are getting a lot of rain and it's getting cold up that way. What What are your cattle like right now? Well, it just depends on the pasture. We've got some that look pretty good, and uh, you know we've got some that look like they're starving to death. So, it's it's been a year. You know, we started off really slow. It was it was a really wet and cold spring. We we actually ended up having two frosts on our corn this year, which is I don't think it's happened in forever. Uh, you know, and the grass didn't really start growing until May for us, uh, and then we have a drought 
and uh, now we're you know now we're washing away again i want to say we've had close to 16 inches in september and october and november is starting off the same way and you also grow soybeans you had three uh 600 acres tell me a little bit about what what that rain has done to your your fields well the uh you know luckily not having as many acres as, as other farmers you know we we hit it pretty hard and and got most of it out we didn't have too much damage uh, i know there's still a lot of beans in the field up in this area you know and there's a lot of a lot of it they're going to be destroyed that, that will not be harvested i think the other day they said they're around 60 70 percent damage right now in the field hmm. uh, so any any beans still in the field are a total loss you know the the cotton guys that have cotton are battling that issue right now too there's you know the majority of the cotton is still in the field in this area so it's uh it's it's been an interesting fall what's your crop been like uh, the beans were okay uh, you know we, we had i would say you know maybe average to slightly above average bean yields this year um here which was surprising with the with the drought we had um you know did have quite a bit of ir- irrigated beans but but even the dry land beans surprised me and corn was just the opposite you know our corn crop was probably the worst corn crop we've had in 15 years oh wow um, you think that was the frost and uh, uh yeah i mean it's a combination it was the, it was the two frost early you know it's just the in a lot of sandy land, the corn just didn't want to grow. You know, it was saturated, it was cold, and then we immediately go into a drought. So um, even the irrigated corn just really disappointed this year. I know you were uh, putting up gates all day today. How much is this uh, this cold, wet weather hampering you right now in uh, trying to do everything you need to do for your cattle and, you know, put away hay? Because I know y'all, y'all were really late cutting hay. Yeah, well, luckily we, we were able to buy most of our hay uh, at the first cutting, um, something we usually try to do. We, uh, not enough hours in the day for us to bail our own hay, but we are, we did plant cover crop on all of our row crop ground and we're going to graze the majority of it. And, uh, you know, this, this, this wheat and clover and stuff we've planted is just not growing right now. You know, we've got terrible stands and, you know, we had so many cloudy days and so soil is so saturated, but we're just not getting any growth right now. And, uh, I think we're going to be getting some yearlings in two days oh wow well and it's muddy you know so and that really doesn't help turning cattle on your row crop ground when it's this muddy but we'll see we'll keep our fingers crossed and uh, be optimistic for some drier weather soon well jacob we will be praying for you to get that drier weather soon he is jacob rumbaugh he raises cattle and grows row crops up there in northwest louisiana Thanks again to Avery Davidson for helping us out while we're up in Kansas City at the National Association of Farm Broadcasters Convention. Coming up next, it's time to look at the markets. We call up our regular market analysts with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association, as well as Dave Foster steps in to talk about the cattle markets. That's next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Believe it or not, your food doesn't come from the grocery store. It just may have been grown on a farm right here in Louisiana. And those jeans you're wearing may have come from a Louisiana cotton farm. Louisiana's farmers and ranchers take pride in producing the food and fiber that we all use in our daily lives. So each time you sit down to a meal or get dressed for the day, thank a Louisiana farmer or rancher. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Now let's look at the markets with insight from the experts at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. And to talk about the markets, we check in with Grayson Close. Grayson is a grain marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. Grayson USDA released its latest crop production and supply and demand report on Thursday. Let's start with soybeans. Did you see anything in that report in the soybean numbers that surprised you? Yes, U.S. carryout coming way up to 955 million bushels for this year is what the USDA is projecting for the 18-19 crop. That is huge. Um, that's that's pretty close to a corn number, really. And if you think about it, that, that means that exports are going down. 
Uh, production is obviously up from, for this year, even though they did lower yield a little bit. Um, production is up, and that's driving those carryout numbers up. Grayson, when we look at the market's reaction, initially we saw double-digit losses in the soybean market, but uh, as we neared the close, the market recovered, so it doesn't look like that, you know, even though we have that big number, it didn't have a lot of effect on the market. No, the, the knee-jerk reaction was there. Like you stated, we, we came down as low as $0.13, cents, but we came back up to close within a, a penny or two of the open, so... Uh, market really just shrugging it off and then we're going to look for looking forward to to what china and trump work out as far as a trade deal and then we'll see the, the markets react to that uh whether whether it's a favorable deal or not what about the corn numbers in that report grace and how did they look uh corn pretty much staying the same production down a little bit and that uh and demand down a little bit as well um, but with the bigger production loss and demand loss, so that the carryout numbers did come down a little bit, um, not a whole lot. And so it's, it's really corn has actually been up most of the day. So it's not really corn favoring better in this report than, than, uh, soybeans did. Well, when we look at wheat, Grayson, I know we've got wheat going in the ground right now. You know, wheat has just been a crop that, has really kind of fallen out of grace here in Louisiana. It doesn't look like the wheat market is really doing much to encourage any more acreage. Uh, anything in the wheat numbers in the report that you noticed? No, wheat, well, wheat numbers pretty much stayed the same. The bad thing about wheat is it's grown 24-7, 365, meaning it's being grown somewhere in the world every day of the year, year in and year out. So uh, even even with lower numbers for us, uh we're overpriced in the world market, and it's kind of hard to compete when we're more expensive than everybody else. Grayson, I wanted to get an update from you. We've talked uh, over the last several weeks about the soybean situation. Tell me what's going on with your customers out there as far as soybeans, get trying to get these damaged beans marketed. What's the latest on that situation? It's been interesting. I was looking at the USDA report today showing Louisiana uh, crop production, and they're saying that we've harvested 1.31 million acres of beans. Uh, and if I remember correctly, we planted 1.34. I'm pretty sure there was a lot more beans left in the field or plowed under than 30,000 acres. So that's kind of an interesting number to me that stands out. Uh, as far as damage is concerned, it's still there. We're still dealing with it, and it may be February or March before we can really get get chewed through it uh, and, and and make room for for better stuff or or more damaged stuff at these elevators and get back to somewhat of a normal market circumstances. Grayson Close with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. Thanks a lot, my friend. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let's move over to the rice market now to talk with Mark Tall. He's a rice marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association's Rice Marketing Office in Crowley. Well, the futures market, we continue on a sideways journey with days of small gains and small losses at different times. The real issue is the lack of sizable demand. Buyers wait on the sidelines hoping to capture lower prices while sellers are hoping to get a better price. So in essence, it's a wait and see game. The cash market remains unchanged at 1080 per hundred based on a six 62 over 70, number two, while medium grain offers are still 1296 per hundred based on the same 6270 grade two. Sellers have been fairly quiet since the start of November. However, October was a busy selling month as folks made room for second crop harvest. It's really still early on second crop yields, but yields are being reported all over the place due to rainy weather and a little wind at times. Rice marketer Mark Tall. Now let's switch gears and look at the cattle markets. Dave Foster is a former cattle market reporter here in Louisiana and currently CEO of Cattle Producers of Louisiana. Dave, are things going all right for you today? Yeah, in spite of the weather, I guess you could say, (laughs) but uh, that's something we don't have much control over for sure. It is definitely not. Well, let's talk about the cattle market, Dave. I've been looking through our local Louisiana livestock auction reports this week. And definitely we're seeing another lower trend in prices this week, especially on those heavier weight cattle. Uh, some of those six to seven weight cattle now dropping down below a dollar a pound. So they're getting hit as we've been talking about all fall. Yeah, the, the, the problem with that, of course, is that as we've talked uh, in the past, Kerry, what we're in right now, we're in the market of uh, all the rest of the country. Are, are selling their calf crop, 
And so you, you, we're competing with cattle out of Virginia. We're competing uh, with cattle out of the mountain states that, uh, that are weaning those heavier calves from the six to 750 pounds. And so there's just a slug of them uh, on the market. And, and so uh, they're able to get them closer than, than we are. So the trucking is cheaper. And, and that sort of thing. So we're um, that that's kind of what we're experiencing there. And then uh, I was really kind of hoping that our lighter weight calves, uh, those calves that weigh uh, less than 600 pounds, would uh, would would still be an item in demand uh, for the wheat pasture people. And to a degree, they are. I see that they're dropping down, and they're really pretty pretty bullish on these three and four fifty weight cattle, maybe up to that light five weight, but once you get over that, uh, then then we see uh, then we see a little bit of price pressure on uh, on those. But uh, there again, hopefully our people, the, the majority of them have uh, have gotten sold their calves. But when I say that, I look at the receipts at these auctions in November, and uh, they're still running. Uh, the bigger sales are still running a thousand plus cattle. So. Uh, that's uh, that's a situation that we have to deal with. Dave, another thing you and I have talked about for the last several months is the slaughter cow market. It does not seem to be getting any better either. It is absolutely horrendous. I, I mean, uh, I, I know, and we've talked about making sure that uh, you know you you don't be selling these open cows and and cows after you wean your calves and print check and. You've got a handful of these cows. Well, that may be all right, but when you've got a good number, 20 plus cows, and you're going to get rid of them, uh, and you're talking about this this November time period, it isn't the best time in the world to be selling these killing cows. And then on top of that, we've got a situation where, because of the drought in places like Texas, uh, in that area, a, a big area in western Oklahoma. Uh, and into Kansas in the summer, uh, they just moved a world of cows. And so these packers, these processors, uh, took advantage of that, and, and, and they got a pretty good number. So it's not like they're, they're needing some more cows this time of year when everybody has got cows on the market. And so as opposed to our cow market being for the top end of the cows, being somewhere in that 50 cent range, uh, mid 50s maybe, uh, it takes just a real good cow to bring 40 cents uh, uh, today. And a lot of our cows, having gone through what this weather has done, are, are not in the best shape in the world. So those cows that, again, on a good market, um, on that 50 cent market, would bring somewhere in that uh, in that 40 cent range. Uh, they're bringing down in that 25 to 35 cent range. So it's a shock when these people show up with two or three cows. And the last time they sold cows looking like that, uh, they were bringing in the 40s and 50s, and all of a sudden they're bringing 27 cents. So it's kind of a sticker shock, to say the least. Dave, I know your organization, Cattle Producers of Louisiana, has an informational meeting coming up soon. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's going to be... Um, uh, next Thursday night, November the 15th, uh, at Sheriff Daniels Place, uh, south of St. Francisville. Uh, you can just call myself or get, go to our email that you have on your, your website there, uh, on the voice, I mean, and, 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 uh, we can get you in without a problem. But I, I'm excited, uh, Carrie, because we're, we're going to be talking about things that have to do with what we just talked about. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to talk about the cattle markets. We've got sponsors with Dominic Livestock and Amy Livestock, and, and they're going to share their thoughts about the market and what's happening and what they see in the future. We've got uh, the, the Donna Cupid with uh, Tri-County Parish Co-op. He's, he's going to uh, give us some information on some forages and that sort of thing. We're, we're going to have kind of an open mic, if you will, uh, for producers to kind of share their story if, if they if they're into or experimenting with some different types of grasses or different types of forages 
to extend their grazing season. And, and so, and then we're going to talk about uh, this liver fluke problem that we have uh, with, with not being able to get uh, uh, the, the medicine that we normally use to treat liver flukes. And so we've got uh, Dr. Jonathan Roberts from the uh, Department of Agriculture, Louisiana Department of Agriculture, that's going to talk to us about uh, different alternatives to, to help us out and to get through this type of situation. And then kind of sum it up with uh, where, where have we been, what did we experience, and what, what lessons have we learned from uh, marketing uh, our calf crop here in Louisiana. Dave Foster, CEO of Cattle Producers of Louisiana. Thanks a lot, Dave. Oh, you're welcome. Well, Dave already mentioned one item on the Louisiana Ag Calendar coming up on Thursday, November 15th, the Cattle Producers of Louisiana's Informational Seminar. So what else is coming up? Well, we'll take a peek at the calendar and let you know. The Louisiana Ag Calendar is next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. You know your Louisiana Farm Bureau membership gives you access to the best insurance on the planet, but it can also save you hundreds when you buy a car. On vacation, your Louisiana Farm Bureau membership gets you discounts on hotels and rental cars, and it makes you part of a group that's 143,000 families strong. So go to LAFarmBureau.org or call your parish Farm Bureau office to become a member. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Agriculture. Now to wrap up this week's podcast, let's take a look at what's coming up this week on the Louisiana Ag Calendar. We have several events coming up on the Louisiana Ag Calendar over the next couple of weeks. We'll get it started with November 13th. That's Tuesday. The Ag in the Classroom program is holding their workshop in Abbeville, Louisiana. They've held a whole series of these workshops all over the state, giving teachers the information and materials they need to teach agriculture in their existing subjects. Again, November 13th, this Tuesday, in Abbeville. If you would like to attend that workshop, go to their website, A-I-T-C-L-A dot org. The next day, November 14th on Wednesday, the Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee continues their Veterans Home Project. They'll be visiting the Veterans Home in Monroe. The following day, Thursday, November 15th, is a water well owners workshop in Alexandria. November 15th also is the date that we discussed earlier where the Cattle Producers of Louisiana is holding their informational seminar in St. Francisville. On Friday, November 16th, the Louisiana Beef Industry Council is holding their regular meeting in Baton Rouge at the headquarters of the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry. Any cattle producer is invited to attend this meeting. So if you'd like to know what happens with your beef checkoff money here in Louisiana, you can attend that meeting. Go to the Louisiana Beef Industry Council website for the details on the meeting. And then we have three more dates coming up for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee Veterans Home Project. On November 19th, they'll be at the Veterans Home in Pineville, Also that same day, November 19th, that's on Monday, they'll be in Jennings, Louisiana. Then on Saturday, November 24th, they're holding the same project at the Veterans Home in Bossier City, Louisiana. So the Women's Leadership Committee has been very busy this fall visiting every single Veterans Home in the state of Louisiana and giving them gifts and things that they need to get through the holidays. A great community service project for that group. Well, that is a look at the ag calendar, and that wraps up episode 21 of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. I've enjoyed bringing it to you from Kansas City, where we're here at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Convention. We'll be back home for the next podcast, so I'll see you then. In the meantime, be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at Voice of LA Ag. 
Be sure to like those pages and check out all the latest news and happenings in Louisiana agriculture. We'll see you next time right here on The Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Thanks for listening to The Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Join us again next week. This podcast is produced by Kerry Martin and the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. For more information, be sure to check out our website, voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org and lafarmbureau.org.